Welcome back to Nightmind, friends. And welcome back to our annual October celebration series, SCP Vault. We have been through a lot of items the Foundation has in containment, and thankfully haven't been wiped down for it thanks to the Socialize, Communicate, and Publicize initiative. As mentioned before, my friends in the Foundation, and yes, I do have some, thank you, are always on the lookout for me around this time of year for anything they can get clearance on so we can keep the tradition going. And this time around, they found some familiar ground. During 2017's SCP Vault, we examined a limited copy VHS tape from 1996 that was used as a front for leaking information about Foundation items, produced by an outfit calling themselves Dilly's Home Video. The tape in particular, Dilly's You'll Never Believe It, described eight crazy urban legends with details obscured to pass information on items in Foundation care. As a result of our coverage, the Foundation dug into the history and spread of members of Dilly's home video and successfully tagged a new group of interest. In their efforts to track the members and the media they produced over time with the purpose of leaking Foundation info, they uncovered more items made with the same intention as that old Dilly's tape and have cleared one for our viewing. I have an audio note here from Site42's Dr. Sherman, who has been very kind in providing material that's been helpful for our traditional series. The DVD in question is from May of 2004, one of the last operating years of this particular group of interest. It was titled, Unusual, Covert Protection Service Agent Tells All. Naturally, Covert Protection Service was assigned to those in the true audience for these videos that the content vaguely described leaks about anomalies in Foundation care. The special takes the form of commonly distributed government secrets documentaries featuring figures cast in shadow, often with voice modulation. No individuals within the video are affiliated with the Foundation. The voice belongs to a standard voice actor available for hire at the time, whose script was based on the written confessions of a Foundation agent from what we call a floating mobile task force, the Substitute Teachers, whose members contained enough specialized skills to warrant placement wherever needed. The agent in question had been abusing a stolen supply of low-grade amnestics, known to nullify the effects of standard issue grade for years, allowing him to retire from the Foundation with his memories intact. The agent seemed to write about the experiences that ended in neutralization of the anomaly encountered, presumably as a way to encourage leniency and repercussions if his transgression was ever discovered. While it does provide better clearance for sharing in the public outreach program now, this behavior still would have been met with severe punishment and a very thorough amnesticizing. Everything described in the DVD must be matched with the proper Foundation entry in order to be understood. The script was written to purposefully obscure the truth, while giving audiences some idea of anomalies that existed as a way to avoid detection by our surveillance. Can't say it much better than the doc, honestly. And thanks again for the assist on this year's collection. I've also made sure the final notes were adhered to, as always. I have the full list here of the items referenced, and as mentioned, they've all been neutralized. The quality of the video is exactly what we expect from Dilly's, even with a few years of advancement in prosumer camera equipment. Attempts were made to provide footage interspersed with the narration to assist with the facade of being a genuine Agent Tells All expose, but it's still a lot of talking in the shadows. The video was clearly made to shuttle information and not so much to entertain. With all that established, let's get into it. Even with the quality that comes from Attili's tape, there's still a wealth of anomalous history to be discovered through the stories of a real mobile task force agent who lived long enough to tell his tales. It takes a special kind of person to be where you are right now. A tough person. Someone who can handle the truth, no matter how ugly it gets. You'll never know my name. You'll never know my face. That's the case for dozens of us. We work in the shadows to protect the people in the light. I've worked for over 30 years keeping you safe. Your loved ones, your co-workers, your neighbors, your friends. It's what we do in the Covert Protection Service. That's a name you might have heard in passing, and it's been low profile for a reason. This world is kept as normal as we can keep it, and it takes effort. The aliens, the monsters, the ghosts and specters of the world, they're all out there, and much worse than anything in the horror movies. 
urban legends begin because of people who slip through the cracks. They've seen what's out there, or think they know what they saw. Our job is to deal with it, so it stays a legend. Covert Protection Service makes sure anyone who would spread word about the legends they've seen in the flesh don't remember the details. They're allowed to go on with their lives, blissfully ignorant, while we clean up the mess and keep the peace. Reality stays real, they stay questioning. Most agents are allowed the same courtesy at the end of their tenure. Some of us aren't so lucky. I've seen too many horrible things, unexplainable things. I still have nightmares. Creatures we never knew existed, team members slaughtered, eaten. I've witnessed too much, I remember too much, and I need to share the burden. This is the reality your leaders will never tell you about. These are the stories of what the men and women in the shadows do to make your life possible. You'll always need us, but I pray you'll never have to meet us. When you get into the car and turn on your radio, you can trust what you're going to hear, right? You know your stations, you program them in. The DJs, the music, the talk shows, you know them all by heart. I want you to imagine for a minute what it would mean to listen and find something completely new that just doesn't fit. Something out of order with the rest of your programs. Something that doesn't feel right. Doesn't tell you things you know is fact. Something alien. Now imagine listening to that with someone else and coming to realize they're hearing something entirely different. A reality that doesn't line up with yours. In the 1970s, I was fresh off of the training circuit. New recruits don't get the big jobs. They have to learn firsthand what it's like to encounter the type of things they've been prepared to face. I was deployed to Kansas City, Missouri for my first ground investigation. Our guys had picked up a radio program on the FM dial that didn't sit right with the rest of its listeners. Ordinarily, that's a job for the unlucky bastard who opens complaint letters at a desk on the level below the stars who get to run their mouths for pay. But this was different. This was messing with the heads of people who listened to it. Not everyone, but enough to get noticed. There was a single individual spoken about in this talk program time and time again who just didn't exist. The DJs on the air. They spoke about him like a celebrity, made claims that he had done all sorts of things, acted in movies instead of the stars you knew played them, put on musical performances that belonged to established names. It seemed like a joke, but people were buying it. According to the record for SCP-1649, people were buying it, but only about 17% of listeners. Titled Heckin Becker's Timely Hour, it acted exactly as the agent describes, presenting recollections and news stories about figures in the world who were already known to the public, but now replaced with a single individual no one had ever heard of. The effect was perception-altering, causing listeners to genuinely believe what they were hearing, and from that moment, their historical recollection lined up with the figure in question taking the place of stars like Charlie Chaplin, Elvis Presley, and even political figures like Abraham Lincoln. It ran for only three weeks before a Foundation agent affected by the anomaly realized they tripped over something worth looking into. The broadcasting station was immediately contacted, and the program was removed. Leads behind its creation were investigated, and on May 23, 1974, an apartment was discovered that seemed connected to the supposed radio DJs Heck and Becker. A mobile task force was sent in to conduct a raid, and according to the records, they discovered written scripts for further broadcasts of SCP-1649, analyses of the anomaly's present memetic transference rate, plans for improvement of the memetic transference rate, and several texts in an unknown language. Also discovered were two anomalous devices. One appeared to be a weapon, utilizing an M16 automatic rifle and unknown technology. The other resembled a flashlight, which when activated produced a space-time aperture of variable size on the surface toward which it was directed. The apartment was watched from that point to see if its occupant would return. Eleven days later, an individual was spotted watching the window of the apartment from the sidewalk. Foundation agents detained and interrogated them. Labeled SCP-1649-A, the subject sat for an interview with Dr. Brian Anborough and said he should become part of their group. 
When questioned about the subject at the center of the radio broadcast taking the place of historical figures, 1649A said, He is many things. To us, he, I suppose, is our sovereign leader. To you, he could be a whole new world. I've encountered several, Dr. Anborough replied. Most of them aren't worth the investment. Place your trust in him, 1649A said, naming the redacted individual. He will even help you with your wife. Dr. Anborough paused. I don't, he began. Have a wife, the subject finished. You've met her, though. She's beautiful, isn't she? I think that's enough for now, Anborough said. 1649A then mentioned an event they hadn't begun to tell Anborough about. Surely you'll want to know how to save him, they commented. Dr. Anborough closed the interview immediately. The record indicates that 47 hours later, the subject died from unknown causes. Autopsy revealed the absence of most organ systems and the presence of what is believed to be a biological analog for the technology present in the anomalous devices found in the apartment. The function of the organ slash device is currently unclear as SCP-1649-8 disintegrated within five days of its death. We are a nation of choices, democratic processes, voting, consensus. When it comes to laws, the people have a say. That's the way we like it, and that's the way we keep it. Sometimes the laws go wrong. The laws of reality are usually what we deal with, but once in a while, we come across broken law in both meanings of the term. I went through more small assignments after helping investigate the radio program in Kansas City, worked my way through other small-scale oddities, mostly human in nature, I'd come to learn what it means to deal with some nasty characters, people who thought they were too big to operate like the rest of us, or people who turned out not to be people at all, not in the way that you and I are. I wasn't on the tracing team that learned about the town of Cullen, Nebraska, and I wasn't on the team sent to investigate. If I had been, I wouldn't be speaking to you now. I was on the outside, keeping tabs on our guys inside the anomaly, and it taught me a lesson I'd be learning for the rest of my career. Cullen, Nebraska. There's only one hit for that within Foundation Archives. SCP-3088. According to record, it was subject to an alteration of reality in which any law, bylaw, or town ordinance passed by a legally empowered individual became an immutable law of reality itself. Individuals that crossed the town boundary were immediately subject to its effects and unable to break any existing laws within the town, either intentionally or accidentally. The most immediately noticeable effects, especially for Foundation personnel, were the total inability to leave the town and the removal of all firearms. SCP-3088-1 was the tentative classification for Thomas Ronson, the mayor of Cullen and the only person currently known to be within the town limits legally empowered to pass laws. Whether he himself possessed any anomalous properties was currently unknown. SCP-3088 first came to Foundation attention following an intercepted call from a civilian trapped within to the Sheriff's Office of a nearby town. The call was terminated mid-conversation, at the same time that all wired and cellular traffic into or out of the town ceased. It's true that a mobile task force was sent in to investigate. MTF Sigma-9, the Kansas City Hotsteppers, Agent Denlin Sorsby was team leader, and records hold audio transcripts between Sigma-9 and the Foundation's command team. Initial report contains the following. Immediately after our entry into Cullen, we quickly found that an anomaly is present and encompasses the entire area around the town. All of our firearms were immediately removed from our persons, as if they just vanished into thin air, and all our phones stopped working, cellular and satellite. We also discovered we couldn't leave. Whenever one of us made a move to leave the area, we'd freeze up and become unable to take so much as a step. As soon as we tried to do anything else though, we could move just fine. We tried weighing down the gas pedal on one of our vehicles, but it stopped as if it hit an invisible wall. The town itself seems normal enough at first glance, but everybody here is on edge. They definitely know something is wrong here, though it was hard to get anybody to talk to us. I mentioned our phones not working to a waitress in a diner we stopped at, and she said they were out all over town. Had been for days, apparently. Internet, too. Basically, there's no way to talk to anyone outside of town. Our walkies still work, but they're pretty short range. Didn't take long to work out that the mayor of this place is behind whatever is going on, or at least knows something about it. The way people talk about him, they're either terrified or in awe, or both. 
From what little we could glean, any laws he makes become fact. Apparently, a few days ago he passed a law banning phones and the internet, and a couple weeks ago he wrote a law banning guns. Now all our guns are gone, and our phones don't work. Obvious enough. More audio transcripts relay the team's efforts to investigate the anomaly in Cullen. It was discovered that if you weren't really attempting to leave, you could walk the edge of the town limits, but the invisible wall was still in place. It was also impossible to break any law, no matter how small. The task force was making efforts to approach Mayor Ronson, but bureaucratic process was interfering with a meeting. Making the situation worse was the sighting by a civilian of the team conducting communications on the border a few days later. The task force couldn't close the gap in time to catch him, and the consequences came quickly. According to Agent Soresby's report, our best guess is he was some toady for the mayor, because about an hour later, a new law was passed. We could feel it happening, like a song you haven't heard for years suddenly popping into your head. This new law apparently prohibits talking to anyone outside of the town at all, which is why I'm just having a nice friendly chat with my compatriot, Agent Peters here. Agent Swordsby and Peters discuss the meeting they finally managed to have with the mayor. He seems... unhinged, Swordsby said. I think meeting with him might have been the wrong play, and since it's illegal to punch people in the face or smash a public property, there wasn't much I could do. He started rambling on about fixing the town or something. Since then, we've all noticed people following us around, tracking our movements, who we talk to. Anyway, I got Ronson to agree to another meeting tomorrow, so hopefully that one will go better, but he doesn't strike me as the kind of person who's going to let this shit go. And unless we can find some loophole that's going to let us take him out or break into his house or his office or something to find some answers, we're going to run out of options here pretty quickly. Audio transcripts end here. What follows is an incident report, 3088-1. Approximately three days after the last received transmission from MTF Sigma 9, a localized C-class restructuring event occurred within the confines of 3088. Following the event, all anomalous activity associated with SCP-3088 ceased and all people, man-made structures, and objects within its bounds disappeared, with the exception of one house at the approximate center of the area. Two documents of significance were recovered from the structure. Official documentation regarding newly passed laws in the town of Cullen, Nebraska, and the personal diary of Mayor Thomas Ronson. The entries begin with Ronson's victory in the mayoral race. By what he writes, he seems genuinely enthused about being a force of change in Cullen, having lived there for over 40 years through ways of corruption and ineptitude. His intention is true. He wants the town back on its feet, and the lives of the people improved, beginning with a plan to reopen the mills. Their closure had led to economic suffering in the community, and it seems Ronson ran on a platform of providing new career prosperity in the town. He held a town hall to discuss the details of his plan for the mills. As a small first legislative move in his new position, the mayor also chose to do something helpful, light, and community-minded, an ordinance ban on lettering. Just days later, he wrote the following. Omaha Textiles are interested in getting the mills running again. I like to think it was my incredible sales pitch that did the job, but the reality is it probably was just good timing. They've apparently been looking to expand for a while now. Still, not going to question such a good opportunity. The people of Cullen are honest, hard-working folk but unemployment has been a real problem here. Getting the mills reopened may restore the hope people have lost over the years. Oh, looks like litter ordinance is already paying dividends. Only two days and the town is almost looking spotless. Must have inspired the people to pitch in and clean the place up. The incredible turnaround is noticed in a new way in the following entry. Was talking to Clayton this morning, and apparently there hasn't been a single reported crime in the week since I became mayor. It would probably be a little egotistical to think that's due to my influence but it's a nice thought. The mayor seems to realize the influence at play may not be his in the next entry, as he describes a bill mandating the repair of flood banks on the river resulted in an almost immediate change. I went down with a couple of construction contractors this morning to assess the work requirement, and the bank was as good as new. No sign it was ever damaged at all. It would have been weeks of work, no way it could have been done quietly, and yet there it is, sturdy as the day it was made. It doesn't take long for Ronson to understand the reality he's inhabiting. The laws in Cullen cannot be broken. I feel like I'm going nuts just writing it, but I'm sure of it now. I tried speeding on the way to the town hall today, put my foot down as hard as I could. It stopped right at the point where the car hits 30 and didn't even go a fraction over. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get my foot to press down any harder. It was unnerving. Like some force was preventing me from moving. Like I couldn't control my own body. I've never felt such an awful sensation in my life. 
Others began noticing the situation around the same time, and in a town meeting, one citizen brought it up. At first hesitating, then finding courage as others chimed in, relieved to know they weren't hallucinating. People began to panic, despite the mayor's reassurance, and in short time, acts of revolt occurred. Simon Sackwell came at me in the street while I was talking with Clayton about the situation. Started hurling abuse at me, said this weirdness was all my fault and that I damn us all in the eyes of God or some such nonsense. Reached into his pocket, clearly about to pull a gun, I could see the handle. Clayton obviously could too. He shot Sackwell where he stood, right in the chest. He just reacted, even though Sackwell could never have actually used his gun. I guess the same isn't true of police officers. What a waste. I've declared a state of emergency. It might panic people more, but it gives me some interesting legislative power, which I've used to ban firearms within the town. That'll probably rile up the gun nuts, but they'll see it's for the best eventually. We won't have a repeat of this. In the weeks that followed, at least 500 people fled Cullen, Nebraska. Despite the litter-free town, the lack of violence, the lack of calls to police, and the resurgence of the mills and employment, Mayor Ronson couldn't keep them. Until he decided to enact new emergency laws. He prohibited anyone in Cullen from leaving. Then, to keep the press from finding out and turning the town into a circus, he banned the use of phones and the internet. When the mobile task force arrived, he kept them at bay until he couldn't anymore and the meeting went as poorly in his eyes as it did for Agent Soresby. A second meeting was arranged, going even worse than the previous. Evidently, it left the mobile task force with little choice, as we find from the final journal entry recorded in fall. That bastard Soresby and his friends nearly started a riot today, riling people up, some nonsense about human rights and votes of no confidence. Don't these people realize I'm trying to do what's best for them? How can they all be so blind? Well, I'm going to put an end to this once and for all. First, I'll get rid of these interlopers. Then, I'll see what I can do about this talk of rebellion. Cullen is a good town, damn it. And I won't have it ruined by the ungrateful attitude of people afraid of a hard day's work. The record for SCP-3088 details the following. Analysis shows that, almost immediately following the final entry in the journal, a new entry was added to the recovered documentation regarding newly passed laws. The final law mandated that all military personnel leave the town immediately. The prevailing theory is that due to this final law directly contradicting the previous law regarding the ability for people to leave town, the end result was a reality failure or restructuring event, resulting in the loss of the town and its inhabitants, and the neutralization of SCP-3088. Why Mayor Ronson's house and its contents remained is unknown. Mobile Task Force Sigma-9 has officially been declared lost. I was discussing a preliminary plan to pierce the barrier protecting the town with command when it happened. Have you ever heard a radar go off the chart? It feels the same way nurses have described when they hear a flatline. Everything inside you stirs into action. All we found was the journal that the mayor had kept. No sign of our guys on the inside, except for descriptions of them on the pages. That seems to be a cold, hard law of reality that defies anomalies. Even if we've never confirmed it, too often all that's left of a person is their testimony. Enough to let us look through the gap in the fence, but never enough to give us closure. To this day, we don't know what happened to that task force. They were just the first members in a long line of losses I try to keep in my memory. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's the first lesson I came away with. Even the people in the shadows have codes of ethics and protocols. When our word becomes absolute, we become no better than the threats we've sworn an oath to deal with. Whack jobs, mind alterations, disappearances, reality misalignments, they became run of the mill soon enough. I became a veteran of dealing with unusual people and unusual circumstances. Plenty of disquieting stuff like bugs in the coat that make up the world. Nothing horrible enough to really put you off track for more than a couple of days. Even when we couldn't name the enemy, we knew them, and we could face them, fight them. We won a lot more often than we lost. Sometimes we come across rabbit holes. Some were short, some were long. All of them were impossible. Whenever enough people go missing in any given area, 
The first department notified in the public's knowledge is the FBI. We're given the same memo. Preliminary investigation is used to rule out the normal culprits like serial killers. If what's coming up seems abnormal, we're called in. Over the course of a week, 10 people went missing in New Jersey, all within the span of 65 miles. Any spike in missing persons cases is taken seriously, especially in a short time span, but reports were coming in at the same time about sinkholes appearing where they had never been, almost man-made in nature, and some in places that just didn't seem possible for one to form. I was sent to join the command team, recommended based on my experiences back in Cullen. A specialized task force was called in to investigate one of the sinkholes. I would be monitoring the visual feed alongside a radio point of contact. I remembered how it felt to work with agents in circumstances like this and reminded myself that these were specialists, a team dedicated to exploring anomalies from the inside, a black zone in our knowledge. The team dispatched in Cullen hadn't been part of their group. It certainly was a different mobile task force, MTF Row 001, the Silent Runners. According to the report for this item, SCP-4615, the Silent Runners were dedicated to unexplored anomalous spaces, primarily comprised of personnel with specialized knowledge and skills, as well as Class C personnel who had previously conducted successful exploration missions. Two of these agents, Cole and Rio, were sent in to explore 4615, and the majority of the record is a transcript of the log. A suspended platform was used to lower them down, and it did so for approximately 15 minutes, revealing the hole to be much, much deeper than expected. Initial comments were made by Agent Cole, describing the air to be hot as hell. There's plenty of pressure down here too, Agent Rio added, as if something's squeezing you from all sides. Feels like I'm at the bottom of the ocean right now. Upon reaching the bottom, the agents were faced with a tunnel as round and man-made in appearance as the descent. The material here appeared to be soft, leaving footprints in the ground, which began to fill with a viscous, almost chunky white substance. A sample was taken, and the agents proceeded onward. A few moments later, they paused. Shit, Agent Rio hissed. It always has to get weirder. The radio attendant told them to describe their surroundings. The area was ever-changing. They claimed to be in a mansion one second, and the next it was like a cavern. Further still, it was almost a palace. Dust clung to every surface, and the architecture looked to have been remodeled in styles across various mix-matched decades. Otherwise unremarkable wallpaper caught their eye as the patterns on them pulsed with a blue light. The trail of footsteps kept going on the carpet and the wood, like the agents were still in the tunnel. And yet, they weren't the only ones leaving them. There were old prints, probably from the missing persons who had come across the sinkholes. It didn't take a researcher to guess that a fall down a hole that deep wouldn't kill anyone since the material they would land on would be so soft. Still, they had to find the missing persons and see what state they were in. According to the record, the agents found a purse left by a broken piano containing credit cards and an ID matching one of the missing civilians. Agent Rio noted that the dust covering the purse didn't actually seem to be dust, just something similar in appearance, but chalky in nature. Rio spotted a black chest next and brushed a white coating off some text on the front. Supper memories. It wasn't possible to open, so the agent settled for a picture and carried on until spotting an unidentified light source. There's a big glowing thing at the end of the hallway, Cole noted. Round and brighter than the wallpaper. Might be a light bulb. Lots of little lines running over the surface like veins. It's attached to the ceiling with a rubbery tube, but it keeps dancing around as if there was a tornado in here. A door was spotted right behind it, leading to a communal bedroom with 12 beds. It was an utter mess. Torn sheets and canopies, decomposing leaves, food scraps, and napkins almost two feet high across the entire floor. Bookshelves lined the room between the beds, the books on them seemingly glued in place with more white gunk. And they were strangely wet. Agent Rio succeeded in pulling a book free. Examination revealed the pages had been torn out by what seemed like a pair of jaws. Someone ate the pages out of this book, Cole told command, and the rest of them too from the looks of it. I guess that's no more insane than anything else here, Rio said. But why put them back on the shelves after eating all the pages? Cole whispered. 
Supper Memories. The agents continued their exploration until finding an archway with a bright red curtain at the end of a deeply trodden purple carpet. The room beyond was too dark to see without switching to night vision. The record describes it in the following. A long dining hall with a high vaulted ceiling can be seen beyond the threshold. Red curtains cover the length of the walls on all sides. Six men and four women, all matching the descriptions of the missing civilians, are engaged in conversation around a dark lacquered dining table. Each place at the table is set with a large plate of rice, and each person wears a paper tag displaying their name. The space at the head of the table is unoccupied, as are the two beside it. Idle conversation about dancing was being held at the table as the agents approached. Command gave the order to proceed with a rescue protocol, and on making themselves known, the agents were received with joy and relief, and offered seats at the table. What? We're here to take you all home, Rio told them. We're friends. You can trust us. The sooner you take your seat, the sooner we can all start, a man at the table said. You are the ones we've been waiting for, right? Paula and Abner? Another asked. The agents were taken aback and asked where those names came from. The guest list, a man at the table answered. You were invited after all. You've even got name tags. Cole spotted movement among the curtains in the corner and aimed his gun as the dinner guests continued complaining, urging the agents to sit down so they could begin. They began acting panicked, sobbing and screaming hysterically at the agents to take their places. An unidentified voice echoed out a single word. Impolite. The video feed captured the following. Rio turns around. The antechamber is clouded with a thick vapor assumed to be steam. Cole's flashlight falls on an unclear figure at the top of the spiral staircase. A bell is sounded from an unknown source. Dust is kicked up from the table, and plates crack and vibrate. Rio is seen falling to the ground covering her ears and head, while Cole is seen vocalizing in distress, unable to be heard due to the noise. The chandelier swings violently as the dust clears. Supper time, the unidentified voice said. The video feed ends there. Recovery attempts fail due to the demanifestation of SCP-4615 at that point. An addendum has been added to the report. Nine days after the disappearance of the task force members, the video feed from Agent Cole's camera resumed, minus the audio. The video starts with a white paper card being held in front of the camera for five seconds, reading Supper Memories. It cuts to agents Rio and Cole eating and conversing at the table with a group of missing civilians. The camera is then positioned at the head of the table. Rice can be seen dropping from the ceiling to their plates, and there is intermittent movement from behind the room's curtains. Steam fills the room and drops of sweat occasionally fall across the camera lens. The feed continues in this way for 14 hours, gradually degrading over the course of its final minutes before terminating completely. No further manifestations or transmissions have been reported. Due to the lack of any known anomalous activity for a period of 10 years, SCP-4615 has been reclassified as neutralized. There are different kinds of predators out there. Animal, human, we've met those, we know those. There was something different, something alien, intelligent, with cunning and a sense of camouflage. Ghost stories often have some kind of sense to them, a closure, a scheme, reasoning behind the haunting. This had no sense, except to the primal instincts, the fear that lives in your guts and seldom gets to speak. There is always a bigger beast, and it knows how we eat. Infatuation. It can lead to better things. Sometimes it can lead to horrible things. I've seen obsession before. A lot of what we deal with are cases of obsession or obsession as a direct effect of anomalies. There was a hotel in Tampa, Florida that had been receiving odd letters for a period of eight weeks. The local authorities were already keeping tabs on the situation and being forwarded the messages. Things came to a head when police were contacted over a naked man rushing into the building just under a day after the last letter arrived. Initial investigation resulted in them turning things over to us. A task force shortage due to another anomaly in the Keys at the time meant I was contacted while stationed in Georgia for combat training. My career was progressing farther than I thought, faster than I thought. 
As soon as my flight landed, I was approached for a briefing and picked up in a van headed to the site. There was no stopping along the way to gear up. I had to do it right there on the road. The details given at this point in the video are enough to establish what item in Foundation Records this was. SCP-5385 The information given to authorities that prompted a call to the Foundation were regarding a large flesh hive inside the building after the break-in by the mysterious man. The record provides more details in the description. SCP-5385 was an approximately 30 meter wide amorphous mass of flesh that was located in the center of the Holmberg Hotel in Tampa, Florida, and had spread and embedded itself inside the infrastructure of the building around it. SCP-5385 is composed entirely of human skeletal smooth and striated tissue, with patches of bulbospongiosis and ischiocavernosis tissue being found in small quantities throughout it even after neutralization. In its center was a 5 meter wide mass of functional cardiac tissue in the shape of a human heart, and it had a heart rate of 120 times per minute. SCP-5385 was capable of locomotion, and had the ability to compress and elongate its mass. Throughout 5385's mass were the cadavers of 45 humans, 16 domestic canines, and 20 domestic felines. The cadaver's biological matter were structurally merged with SCP-5385's mass to the point where fully intact removal was impossible. Tumors in the shape of human heads were present on every cadaver. These tumors possessed facial features that appeared to be grinning with their eyes rolled back. All lacerations and injuries made to SCP-5385 and the attached cadavers rapidly regenerated. It was theorized that the corpses within the mass of 5385 were trapped inside it after its sudden formation and died of suffocation, as its mass covering their abdomens would have prevented airflow. The messages sent to the hotel over the eight weeks before discovery of the anomaly are love letters, intimate, adoring, full of longing and desire. There are mentions of this kind of love in defiance of the old man who claims to be the father of the recipient. This father keeps chasing the lover away from the building, and in pursuit of his love, the sender swears to go on a journey to discover his roots and lead the couple into the future. The final letter read, I have climbed the tallest mountain and traveled the twelve seas. I have seen my true nature and scoffed in its face. I rebuked it, ate it, and excreted it from my vessel. The only thing that remains is me, power, and my everlasting adoration for you. That mind, that body, that soul, everything you are is mine, and everything I am is yours, forever and ever. Our souls will be fused into one being and I will know everything you are. I will think your thoughts, I will become them. Every movement, every laugh, every molecule on your body will be as if it was my own. I have found the wheel to turn these gears made out of love into reality. Yes, the time has come. Tomorrow, we will be one. It was from this point that the lover charged into the building, and the flesh high formed in the wake of his entry. The Foundation secured the site and began study and monitoring. Until Incident 001, on February 14th, Valentine's Day. A log is contained in the records of the incident, which took place over the course of at least 20 minutes, and probably no more than 30. The lower parts of the flesh mass began to twist and elongate, crevices ossifying, and the upper section following suit. Overall, it formed itself into a giant humanoid structure, pulling the organic mass away from the bodies trapped inside of it, leaving only their skeletons. It latched onto the roof with its newly formed arms, swung back and forth, and crashed into the lobby of the hotel, destroying four floors in the process. Hundreds of faces bearing the same expression as the tumors on the cadavers appeared on the skin of SCP-5385 as the entity began to dig into the floor of the hotel lobby. Once 5385 had ceased digging, a large crevice in the floor was seen. A loud, wet noise, similar to meat being slapped on stone, was heard from this crevice when a purplish cone-shaped mass of flesh emerged, hereby designated as 5385-A. 5385-A surfaced then split open into four sections, revealing a pink tube, and vocalized, You will become unto me, as I will be unto you. 5385 lost its tumors then, all of them shriveling up and sliding off the body as cone-shaped masses erupted in their places, spewing white foam. A head emerged at the top, its face wearing the same expression as was seen on the tumors. 
It crawled headfirst into 5385A, yelling, To the end of time, together forever. Unidentified noises were heard for several minutes, and then both anomalies combusted, resulting in neutralization. A statement was collected from the police station by the building's owner in the aftermath of the incident. He had been lodging a complaint about a kid who seemed obsessed with his building. A total weirdo, practically stalking the hotel itself. He was the one delivering the love letters, and they had never been about a woman renting a room. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. There are movies and stories about monsters like that. All sorts of freak shows and scare pieces. You don't know what it means to stare into the face of a corpse attached to a living organism, looking like they're still alive. Alive and grinning, their eyes rolled back with pleasure, throbbing and dead. The greatest relief of that deployment wasn't that it was short, it's that I never had to use the combat training I had just been through. The thing eliminated itself, consummating some unholy union that seemed to mock human intimacy. I didn't have to stick around and clean up the mess. It wasn't my department. I'd been given exposure to an element of the service that they needed me to have. In the end, they'd prefer everyone to see just how ugly rifts in reality can be. It gives them more people to throw at the issue when agents are eaten, dismembered, absorbed, turned rabid. Some of them just go insane. I completed my training in Georgia over the following three weeks. They sent me back to Nebraska, my original assignment region. This time I'd be running the Metro Response Unit. I was stationed in a town on the outskirts of Omaha, helping the containment beat on one of our secure sites. We'd like to have multiple routes of interception running through emergency services, since that's the most likely way to catch situations that require us. A call came into the police about the murder of an adolescent girl, with the murderer still being on site, one that wasn't human. Initial judgment of the threat was low level, requiring just two agents for response. I was selected for the experience I had gained in Tampa, though I didn't know that at the time. The Tampa situation might have been grotesque, but this one, this is a very different kind of disturbing. The story is a match for SCP-5739, and the discovery portion goes as follows. Twelve-year-old Emily Cole's body was discovered in her place of residence in Omaha, Nebraska. The entirety of her skin was absent from her corpse. SCP-5739, a 1.5-meter-tall biological entity composed entirely of human epidermises, was recorded levitating above Emily's body, motionless. Emily Cole's older brother, Albert Cole, contacted the local police station over a telephone call, where he was intercepted by an embedded Foundation agent working within the police force. Albert Cole exhibited extreme anxiety during his required interview, turning to look into empty hallways, being startled at mild contact with objects, and disregarding personnel. He was amnesticized shortly after, and all symptoms ceased. An instance of SCP-5739-1, a 35 by 35 centimeter scrap of human skin, was discovered next to Emily's corpse, with a message scrawled into the underside using fingernails. The message in particular is a sort of poem, with direct language found using the first letter in each line. This instance read, Run away, Emily. The event of Emily's death mirrored the claims of several residents of Omaha who had witnessed 5739, all of whom had been submitted to a psychiatric ward and diagnosed with mass hysteria. SCP-5739 was taken into containment without incident, and after some genetic testing, dropped another scrap of skin. This poem, like the first, mentioned elephants, and alluded to those who are encased and wound. The first letter message asked, Can you hear me? A few weeks later, an addendum was provided. Security footage caught SCP-5739 convulsing, followed by a rupture that covered the area and its remains. All of the pieces were concluded to be 5739-1 instances, the scraps of skin containing poems, but most were illegible. Of the poems that could be recovered, the direct messages went as follows. It took their skin. Let us die. What have we done? Goodbye. They called it elephant skin. The poems kept alluding to it. 
and the researchers who studied its structure concluded it kept itself in the shape of an elephant's skull. There was nothing I can tell you to explain why. There's nothing I can tell you to explain how. All I can tell you is that it was the first time I'd seen a body without its flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I'd had enough of anomalies dealing with masses of skin already, and I'd only ever seen two. The witnesses gathered in the psych ward were given flashes and released, able to go about their lives. Cover stories were provided about the deaths of the victims. We don't know if they were ever collected inside of that thing, or if it was just a being at the center of it mimicking them somehow. I was released from Omaha the following year. I have never been released of the memory of that girl's body. The question comes around from time to time about how often things like this happen. I've asked it myself to higher-ups, veterans and researchers. The answer always varies according to experience. Agents like to share war stories. I remember telling an old-timer in a command position about Tampa once, and you know what he told me? It gets worse, son. It always gets worse. I took his words to heart. I had to. Combat training had been more specialized than it usually is for soldiers, and I'd seen evidence firsthand of the things that shouldn't be. But he kept going. I've overseen operations I hope you never hear of. I put bullets in creatures who only moved faster once you shot them. He looked me in the eye and asked how long I had until my post turnover. I told him, and he sat me down. Son, he said, has anyone ever told you about Outpost 54? There's more than one outpost numbered 54 in the Foundation archives, but in following the details that come after in the agent's story, it alludes to only one entry, SCP-1983. Described as a one-story farmhouse in Wyoming, it was abandoned in 1968 after a series of ritual murders, allegedly performed by a satanic cult. The front door of SCP-1983-1, when opened, appeared to contain a spatial anomaly. Neither matter nor light had been observed to exit the doorway, save for instances of 1983-2. 1983-1 was accessible through other entrances, including windows, the back door, and entrances cut into the back of 1983-1. However, the front room did not appear to exist outside of 1983-1. Attempts to drill into the front room of 83-1 from the outside led to the exposure of smaller portions of the anomaly, though instances of 83-2 weren't observed to exit. 1983-2 were bipedal creatures approximately 1.8 meters tall, vaguely humanoid, and entirely black in color. They were highly aggressive and would engage any human on site. When an instance of 83-2 came into contact with a human, they extended an upper limb into the human's chest cavity without any apparent damage to skin or tissues. Through unknown means, they extracted the heart, killing the human. Once acquiring a human heart, the instance of 83-2 would return to 83-1. Silver munitions fired while offering prayer was the only known method of killing 83-2. The precise form of the prayer or religion of the supplicant did not appear to matter, so long as the prayer was sincere. Once killed, the bodies of 83-2 appeared to disintegrate, leaving a small layer of sulfur. 83-2 was discovered after a series of mysterious deaths in the surrounding area. Foundation investigators encountered instances of 83-2 and were able to trace them back to the farmhouse. One mobile task force, Shy 13 was sent in through the front door to investigate and never returned. A second team was arranged to determine the fate of the first. They also did not return, and this time the front door stayed open after entry. When new manifestations of 83-2 appeared, Agent Morris entered, and the door closed after them. For attempt three, a member of D-Class was given a camera and sent inside, but once past the door, the camera feed died and the cord snapped. Hours later, the anomaly affecting the farmhouse ceased. Inside, the desiccated remains of several agents were discovered as well as document 83-15, an informal SCP report written by an agent within the anomaly. Item number, pending. Object class, Keter. God help you. Special containment procedures. You're going to die, you poor dumb fuck. This isn't a threat. I'm Agent Barclay. 
I'm in the middle of this goddamn thing and I'm telling you, if you're here, you're going to die. I'm probably already dead. So that's out of the way. Let's get to the containment procedures. There's really only one. Close the goddamn door. You aren't going to get back through there. You've probably already tried. But we know they can get out if they try hard enough. That's how we found this fucking place. Hopefully you've already done that. I know we did once we gave up on getting out through there. If you didn't, then you go straight back and get that door closed. That is your only priority right now. You're going to die anyway. Might as well do some good before you're gone. Agent Barclay goes on to describe his experience once his mobile task force entered the house. The living room was bad enough. That's where they got O'Brien. They reached in and suddenly he killed over and one of them took off with his heart and its claws, I guess. They're less distinct here. You probably noticed that. They're like shadows. Stay away from the light. I know that sounds stupid, but think about it. In the light, shadows are stronger. They have edges. When it's dark, they're indistinct. They can hardly touch you and they don't see very well. I think they see by your shadow. I don't know. I'm just pulling at straws here. I'll be honest. You've probably already tried going back out the door, but if you haven't, don't. It leads to some place even worse. There aren't any monsters, but... Jones went too far from the house, and I swear to God he started to melt. Things started popping out of him, and... All you need to know is he didn't make it back. That's when we closed the door. This place? It's big. It's not just the farmhouse. It's like... It's like they stole bits and pieces of a lot of places and stuck them all together. There's some bits that look like an apartment, some that look like a shopping mall, and even what I swear is a closet from my old high school. Same patterns on the tiles and everything. There's also bits that are made out of... Stuff. It's black like the shadow things, and it's mostly in the well-lit places. If the lights go out, you can stick your hand through. I don't recommend it. That's how we lost Torres. Something grabbed him, pulled him through. The hole wasn't big enough for his head, but he still went through eventually. So, stay away from the light places, but watch your step when it's dark. Of course, there's no way out. We figured that out too. Any door you find, it either just leads to another room in this nut house or it leads out there, and it's pretty obvious we can't live there. So it's wait until you starve to death or one of those things gets you. Great bunch of choices, huh? There's one thing you can do. I couldn't go through with it, but maybe you can. It won't help you live, I don't think, but it's... I think it's important. I'm pretty sure someone's going to have to, or those things are going to get out eventually. It's the nest. I only saw it once, for a few minutes. We followed one of the bastards after they got Denning's heart. Took it into a room that I guess is in the middle of this whole place. It's all black stuff, and they've dragged in every kind of light they could find, I guess. Lamps, flashlights, candles, you name it. Some of them were carrying more in as we watched. Anyway, at the middle there's a big pile of hearts, just tossed in a heap and torn open every one. They threw Denning's heart on the pile and it started to beat and then pulse and thrash around. Then it tore open and one of those things pulled itself out. It shook itself, started to grow and then went right to work. The gross thing is that, torn apart as they were, they... The hearts kept beating. That was when I ran. I couldn't take it. You understand? I wasn't trained for this kind of shit. I heard the others behind me. I don't know if they were trying to stop me or if the bastards had spotted us, but we got separated. I found a nice dark closet and I've been hiding in here since. I've been writing my pen light. I turn it off whenever I hear one of them getting close. It's worked so far. I can't go any further. I've got a few shots left in my gun, but I can't pray anymore. I can't pray and mean it. Not after I saw the nest. But you, if you found this, you've got to be an agent too. Maybe you're stronger than I was. If you can, go in and destroy the nest. Destroy every last heart. If you do, maybe it'll kill them. 
It's the only thing I can think of. You'll probably die doing it, but you're dead anyway. So what's it matter to you how it happens? Me, I'm going to try and get this report back to the living room, which I hope is where you found it. Then I'm going to make sure they can't use my heart to make another one of those things. Good luck. SCP-1983 is presumed to have been neutralized by D-14134, who was posthumously awarded the Foundation Star, one of only two awarded to Class D personnel. Due to information contained in document 1983-15, it is believed that the anomaly was not localized as previously believed, and renewed resources have gone into attempting to locate similar incidents. After hearing a story like that, the logical response is to dismiss it, laugh it off. It's someone having a scare at your expense. In this business, every scare is real. Every shadow has something inside of it, but I hadn't been exposed to anything like that during my career. In the years I've operated, I've seen the monsters that tear your heart from your chest. I've known fear. I've gone from hearing a man die in the field to seeing it firsthand. There are always more stories to tell, and even now, they're happening around you. Covert Protection Service is keeping them from ever reaching your ears. Be careful out there. Question your surroundings. Look into the darkness, but don't look too deeply. The darkness looks back. I have no doubt that there were more stories in the journal that Dilly's home video had in their possession from the agent whose stories were lifted. The Foundation's investigation into the rest of the media they created is ongoing, and if given clearance in the future, we may find where the remaining stories in the journal ended up. For now, we come away with knowledge of neutralized anomalies and Foundation records that we can be very glad weren't protected. I'd like to thank Dr. Sherman of Site42 for providing insight into this year's vault material. Site42 is proud to offer links to its public-facing information in the description of this video as part of the aforementioned Socialize, Communicate, and Publicize initiative, and all fans of the Foundation should check it out. If you'd like to explore SCP Vault specials from years past, you can check out my playlist, which I'll have linked in the video description, as well as a full Nightmine Halloween playlist, so you can get an even bigger dose of October celebration. Thanks to all of the authors of the Foundation records utilized in our research. Thanks to all of you for watching. And thanks to my supporters on Patreon, who help make continued exploration of the SCP archives possible. If you'd like to support Nightmind, you can do so for as little as just $2 a month, which gets your name in the credits of all major videos and allows you into the Patreon community with our Discord. This also supports the Nightmind Index for new and emerging unfiction projects. And if you can't do Patreon, you might have noticed the new thanks button below my videos. You can donate a personal thanks to me directly this way and your comment will show up with a special tag. So, if you enjoy what I do, or particularly enjoy this episode and want to say thanks that way, you can do so, and I greatly appreciate it. Thanks for joining me in the dock again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and I'll be seeing you again real soon. Make sure there's nothing anomalous lurking nearby on your way to bed, and sleep tight.